Sveiki visi, susirinkiai į antrąjį kibernetinio saugumo mėnesio seminarą. Aš esu Vaidas Rubukas, tinklų ir saugumo skyriaus vadovas, dirbu kompanija Blue Bridge MSP. Aštuonių webinarų ciklą IT ir verslo bendruomeniai pasiūlėme palaikydami Europos Sąjungos kibernetinio saugumo mėnesio iniciatyvą. Registracijai daugelį mūsų ir partnerių seminarų vis dar atvira, tad kviečiu pasidaryti ir drąsiai registruotis. O jeigu nespėsite, tai vėliau seminarų įrašus rasite mūsų YouTube kanale. Kiekvienais metais spalio mėnesį visoje Europoje vyksta šimtai veiklų tokių kaip konferencijos, workshopai, mokymai, webinarai, pristatymai, kurie supažindina su skaitmeninio saugumo problemomis ir organizacijas, ir eilinius naudotojus. Ir Blue Bridge nori jau kelinti metai prisideda prie šios iniciatyvos ir vienas iš tokių renginių, netrukus jūs sulaukiantis seminaras apie praktinį kriptografinio saugumo modulio, angliškai Hardware Security Module arba HSM, panaudojama pasitelkiant mūsų kainynų estų patirtį. Šiandien pranešimą pristatys Altacom pardavimų inžinierius Tanel Jevstignėjev, Jis supažindins mūsų HSM, kas tai yra, kaip naudojama ir būtent panalizuos STI pritaikytą modelį, kuris padeda atitikti Europos kibernetinio saugumo reikalavimus. Turbūt teko girdėti apie STI naudojamą X-Row tinklą, kurio saugiai ir automatiškai apsikeičiama informacija tarp valstybinių institucijų, pradžiai Šis tinklas buvo sukurtas būtent šiam tikslui, bet šiuo metu vis daugiau privataus verslo prisijungia prie to tinklo ir netgi apsikeitimas dominimis vyksta tarp valstybių, tarp mestijos ir Suomijos. O kiekvienos organizacijos tarpatybės saugoma būtent HSM įrenginyje ir kiekviena žinutė kriptografiškai pasirašoma taip kitai šaliai užtikrinamas informacijos autentiškumas. Šiandien Daniel mums ir papasakos plačiau apie šį projektą. Altacom yra Blue Bridge partneris, su kurio bendradarbiaujame siekiant užtikrinti tą patybių saugumą, naudojant HSM įrankį. Daniel, I have made a brief introduction and now the screen is yours. Excellent. So, hello everybody. I'm Daniel Jevstignejev technical engineer from, from Altacom. Um, Altacom is an IT security solutions distributor. Uh, we operate in three Baltic countries and, and in Finland. Um, and for the uh, past uh, eight years, uh, we've been helping uh, manage service providers, uh, manage IT service providers to be, become more efficient uh, to, and helping them to grow their business. Um, and uh, Altacom probably isn't your average uh, distributor in a way that we actually work really closely with various communities. For example, we started MSP Baltics community where we're able to manage service providers to share knowledge, uh, expertise, uh, and allowing them to network. Um, and also we are working closely with the FinTech community, for example, which is really strong in, in uh, Lithuania, for example, and now allowing the fintech companies uh, to integrate with SEPA instant payment uh, framework via Lithuania Central Bank's uh, framework called Centralink. We also work closely with uh, various electronic ID systems like uh, uh, with, with OCMA in Latvia, of course, uh, the X-Road uh, framework and system uh, in Estonia. So today I'm sharing a little bit of my experience, uh, of my involvement uh, of securing the digital society and my experience with, with X-Road. So when we're talking about the digital society and, and digital economy in general, we, we need to talk about trust because the trust is such a necessity in a global Uh, digital world, which is ever reliant on, on, on ever reliant on ever increasing connectivity, uh, 
ever increasing data use and, and use of innovative technologies. So the, the technologies uh, extend throughout almost every aspect of our lives nowadays uh, and, and every segment of our public and, and private institutions. So in, in order to, uh, for the technology to be trustworthy, it must be secure. So ensuring the, the uh, connected systems, confidentiality, integrity and, and availability, uh, as well uh, responsible use. So, so while the, the trust is fundamental building block of our society, um, uh, the, the trust of digital society has become one of the major challenges of our time. Uh, digital society, in digital society, we, we consume trust on a daily basis, uh, pretty much. So for, for us consumers, everything seems seamless uh, and indivisible, yet it's, it's such a fundamental factor in our world. And, and digital trust is used, for example, in national ID programs, uh, single sign-on procedures in, in various places, um, also used in uh, signing documents uh, or encrypting documents or emails. Uh, authenticating or, or verifying authenticity of documents via digital signatures um, or authenticating, authenticating uh, citizens, uh, their identities for various online services. So while we aim to be uh, for, for the digital society, um, we, we actually face quite many challenges on the way. Um, uh, firstly, as, as, as I mentioned already, we have uh, from one side the various security needs. We need to make sure that the data or information that we share, uh, uh, the access rights to it is properly managed. Uh, also, we need to make sure that the basic IT security uh, is met. Um, so the systems can be trusted, trustworthy, they're oper operating and integrity, authenticity and everything um, can be assured. And on the other side, um, while we do this digital transformation, we aim for efficiency. Uh, we want to uniform processes to save costs uh, and we want to standardize things. So. Um, how we can combat these challenges uh, is through uh, standards and compliance. So um, European Union has developed uh, this framework called EIDAS, which is electronic identification, authentication uh, and trust services, which regulates electronic identification and trust services for electronic transactions in European single market. So it aims kind of for, for two things. First of all, interoperability, meaning that member states are required to create common framework that will recognize the, the ID is electronic documents from other member states, other countries, uh, EU countries, and uh, ensure, in a way, ensure uh, authenticity and security. So uh, that makes it easy for users or companies conduct businesses across uh, country borders. And secondly, transparency. So um, EI just provides a clear accessible list of trusted services that may be used within a centralized signing framework that allows uh, security stakeholders the ability to engage in, in dialogue about the best technologies and, and tools uh, in order to secure the infrastructure. So, um, EI just kind of provides the regulatory environment for, for certain key aspects of our uh, digital identities. First of all, the entire like, digital uh, identities in general. Uh, that includes, for example, advanced and electronic signatures, uh, qualified and advanced uh, uh, seals, various electronic certificates, uh, also qualified web authentication certificates, uh, and also now looking into the future, then a European digital identity wallet, which aims to bring into, let's say one container 
all your digital ID identities, uh, starting from your passport, uh, national ID card, driving license, um, medical certification, so every, everything that deals with your electronic ID in general, uh, the aim is to incorporate that into one, one single package. Also, uh, working with digital archiving, so making sure that the data is archived, saved, stored in a secure manner, and uh, the authenticity uh, can be later on um, verified. Uh, also, uh, they are looking into digital ledgers, meaning that uh, finding the, the ways how they can incorporate blockchain uh, and how the blockchain can be utilized, uh, help being uh, in, in digital society um, and uh, uh, with, with various transactions. And lastly, maybe that I would like to mention is also remote signing and remote sealing, which currently, currently um, uh, we do it let's say, on site that uh, every, each person or company uh, possesses their private keys, which they use to sign documents or seal documents. And what we see is that um, the market and European uh, Union in general is slowly moving and, and allowing the access to remote signing and sealing, meaning that the service operator uh, has your private keys um, and certificates. Uh, of course, uh, there is a, a strict procedures and, and ways how you regulate who can access and how uh, your, your private keys can be used uh, for various services. Um, and also, uh, when we talk about security, then um, we have security standards. So from one side, we have FIPS. Uh, FIPS has various security levels, uh, which then ensure that we meet certain security standards. And, and FIPS has four levels. For example, the highest levels allows um, certain uh, systems to be placed in, in truly hostile environments where bad actors could potentially physically access them. Uh, and, and on the other side, we have common criteria, which then certifies the, all the processes of uh, organization, starting from <clears throat> access rights to the building, how they build the software, how they um, uh, uh, send the, the, their uh, products out, the delivery processes, everything. And of course, the protection profiles come on top of that, ensuring again, uh, uh, the, the <clears throat> and setting the minimum security standards um, uh, for various systems. And now when you talk about electronic identities, uh, then, then, of course, we, we have to talk about compliance, regulation, and, and, and standards. So, um, uh, we, we are touching the retrust uh, topic, and, and how then we can actually create the trust in digital society, then uh, for sure the key aspect uh, of, of creating trust is via technology. So, and the basis uh, uh, of, of this trust is public key infrastructure, PKA, and digital certificates, uh, which uh, in a way create this chain of trust, which can be used in all kinds of services in interaction uh, in, in the digital world. Uh, and, and in order to become compliant with various regulations, a route of trust is required to store digital certificates and seals. So, um, uh, here, HSM is used to offer its root of trust and meet compliant uh, requirements, which are ma mandated by EIDAS. So briefly, what's the HSM is about? So HSM is like a safe. Uh, and it stores your keys, certificates, your di digital, in a way, digital identities, um, and regulates who and how can, and also it, it processes the data uh, in a secure manner. So the key point is that we need to understand what is the, the, the weak link. Uh, 
because uh, traditionally um, we haven't paid enough attention to the digital uh, identity side in a way that uh, once the identity gets stolen, then uh, this can have a dire consequences and meaning that once your, the key is found, your, your key is, is compromised. Um, and HSMs actually are used in all kinds of areas uh, uh, in, in different industries. So, so HSM itself is nothing new. It started, uh, was developed in, in the 70s, and now over the years, um, it, it's being utilized pretty much everywhere in every industry. We could have um, uh, government and healthcare sector, for example, you, uh, is taking care of uh, using HSM heavily, issuing electronic IDs, uh, creating secure documents, uh, issuing passports, and also verifying the passports, uh, doing various personalization uh, procedures, or, or it's been used immigration and, and border checks, border controls issuing various uh, other forms of documentation identi uh, uh, identification uh, documents. HSM is providing timestamping services, making sure that uh, certain aspects of thing or transactions happened um, uh, at a certain time. Uh, providing signature services, sealing and, and signing, for example, and of course, uh, public key infrastructure in general. HSM is, is used heavily as well in the financial and payment uh, sector. For example, issuing credit cards or various cards um, or membership cards uh, to customers. Uh, also, uh, again, talking about credit cards, then, then chip key management uh, to generate and, and issue the keys that are stored on the cards, uh, customer identity management sites, uh, various transaction securities, uh, when doing payments, um, when doing um, um, or used in, in uh, intra banking uh, or central uh, core banking uh, systems. Then um, uh, we have PSD, Open Banking Standard, allowing fintechs to tap into the uh, banking sector and creating this um, standardized framework and, and uh, compliance requirements. Um, uh, in ATM uh, networks, uh, also uh, HSM helps the financial sector to meet the PCI, PCI DSS uh, regulation, which uh, pretty much governs the entire payment sector. Um, of course, industry and I IoT, especially when we talk about um, Industry 4.0, um, uh, when we talk about smart meters, uh, uh, any kind of smart endpoints, um, then uh, HSM has to be used there. Any kind of endpoint personalization, identification, creating secure zones within, within the uh, infrastructure, inserting keys, doing any kind of over-the-air updates, um, signing the updates. Uh, and of course, looking into the future, when we talk about uh, Industry 4.0, for example, is machine-to-machine -machine, uh, communication, assuring that the, the entities say and, and making sure that they are who they claim they are, securing the communication, uh, which is really a key part when you talk about automation in general. Um, also, when you talk about the future side, 5G networks, uh, HSM has to be used there. Uh, when we shrink SIM cards, uh, when we creating any kind of secure channels, encrypting channels uh, for our customers or in the core network in general, um, or, or using in various uh, verifications 
of uh, endpoint devi uh, devices providing various kind of streaming services, for example. So, so these are just a couple of the, uh, the things uh, where HSM has been used um, auto industry, um, uh, uh, entertainment, uh, digital rights management, uh, uh, in, in corporate world, securing the infrastructure. So there are many, many, a lot of, lot of use cases nowadays where HSM are being used, but they are kind in, in the background and um, uh, invisible to the um, average person. Now, when we talk about the Estonian's digital transformation, then uh, for sure the X road uh, played a major role enabling the nation to transform. Uh, and and become of one of the leaders in, in digital society. Um, and, and the, the vision of, or, or aim of, of X-Road uh, is that they want to be modular, easy to adopt, easy to use, cloud native, secure app, and a sustainable data exchange solution. And current scope is that they want to be a core digital infrastructure component in the Nordic and, and the EU countries. And actually, to be honest, um, um, yeah, European, European Union in general, uh, and also become the worldwide, well, well-known framework or technology solution. Um, I, when, when, when actually talking about X Road, then I have to start a little bit from the beginning and maybe tell you about the background, why it actually, uh, uh, why everything started. So by two thousand. Uh, 2000, then um, Estonia already had qu quite many various databases, information systems, um, uh, which uh, stored various data of, of citizens, companies, organizations, and, 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 and so on. Um, and by that time, many of the these uh, inf information systems relied on each other's information or data. And also various portals use the data um, to fulfill, fulfill uh, various requests. Uh, and all these databases and information systems were developed independently. They had their own APIs, etc. So for the, for the consumer side and, and service provider side, uh, offering various services to, to citizens, it be, became a major headache to maintain the compatibility of various APIs and ways how you can access various information systems. So there was a real need to unify, first of all, um, the software and hardware side uh, for organizational measures. So because uh, maintaining the connectivity compatibility with all these information systems consumed a lot of money, resources, and wasn't really effective. So um, the idea of X-Road started before uh, 2000. It took, took about three years to fully mature. So by 2001, it was kind of implemented. So, so the aim was what, to unify the communication uh, from consumer perspective, like civilian um, uh, office clerks and, and so on, and also from the information system perspective. Um, so instead of everyone having their own ways of communicating, doing business, uh, to have this common framework. And also really important was that they wanted to aut automate as, as many things as possible to remove the human interaction aspects altogether. And, and also this, uh, we already had ID cards, national ID card, electronic ID card. So, so um, this already, we had this, let's say baseline, which allowed us to have this authentication service um, uh, uh, to, to build on this complex access or more complex access rights uh, system. So these are old pictures of the system when we, it was released. So in, in uh, the X-Road looks like this, that you have your customers, citizens, various offices, 
um, and they're using uh, various portals or systems and the systems are you uh, talking to or they are have security servers which is like uh, one of the uh, cornerstones of of the x road uh, enabling the connectivity and and x road has actually this two step verification process the first of all when you trying to let's say citizen tries to access x road they are being authenticated and verified that you know to which <clears throat> excuse me to which kind of services they have access to and secondly when they uh, the security servers servers or various portals send requests then they are verified uh, against uh, uh, central uh, access list to which services they actually have uh, access rights and, and and can these various portals access the information uh, they are trying to access uh, it's using soap uh, framework um, uh, so so uh, it's like uh, this kind of it's it's somewhat a closed ecosystem but then again open source one and we talk about the the x roads and the about the ecosystem then uh, one of the key aspects there is the operator uh, the operator controls uh, who has access to the x um let's call it a community, and, and also defines uh, various regulation ap aspects uh, within the ecosystem uh, that the other participating members need to follow. Uh, and also, the x -road itself can be nationwide, or it can be really closed and limited only to certain organization for internal needs. Um, uh, so, so this can be utilized for various various ways, uh, and then you have trusted network. Uh, so, Xroad in general is open source. Um, I'm not sure if if you actually. So, not sure where I actually was cut off. Um, I was talking about trusted networks, um, and then. Uh, about authorization, but I'm just really, really quickly rephrasing that uh, the the um, uh, entrusted network, all the participating uh, service providers, they are in control of the data they are providing, uh, and it's contr controlled. And authorization frameworks that service providers actually manage. Uh, man um, managing the access rights to various services. Uh, you can monitor um, and, and uh, create various reports in each road. So the service providers can actually have various um, uh, information uh, and statistics about how their services are being used um, and how uh, they are connected to, to various other systems. And of course, one of the key aspects now is the cross-border data exchange. Uh, so allowing these various information systems uh, in x -Road framework to talk to each other across borders, across countries, or uh, across uh, closed, uh, uh, closed environments. So, um, and a little bit about the, the, the x uh, yeah, sorry, x models. So I, I said that uh, you have operator who is kind of responsible of all the aspects of, of the operations within this, um, a, um, the, the, the given x -road. Uh Then you have service providers. Service providers are offering, uh, well, usually they are maintaining various information systems, registries, so to speak, uh, and then they, they offer access to their registries and, and services to consumers. Consumers can be organizations, uh, citizens. Um, so it depends um, uh, you know, uh, the, the various uh, users of, of the network and uh, uh, via the uh, operators defined framework, they can either you know, grant have access uh, the consumers, I mean, have access to various services or not. Then you have uh, trust services uh, uh, that, or trust service providers that offer timestamping services, meaning that all the transactions within XROAD framework, they get 
signed, sealed. Uh, so every, every step uh, is verified, signed and sealed. All the transactions, queries uh, within the uh, XROS framework. And then, of course, uh, since it's public key infrastructure, we have uh, uh, certificate authorities, um, so uh, issuing certificates uh, uh, for the uh, service providers. Now, over two decades, uh, XROOT has grown a lot. Uh, it started in Estonia and now uh, uh, it's it's um, and it was maintained in Estonia and now uh, actually it's a joint venture with Finland. Currently, uh, there's this Nice um, uh, organization that is governing the development of X Road. Um, we have already quite many X Road has quite many uh, active implementations around the globe. Uh, we see a lot of interest in Southern uh, America and in Asia. And uh, also there are ongoing uh, uh, consultancies uh, with, with um, European, various, very European countries, um, which are looking into utilizing Geeks Road um, uh, to, to helping them, their uh, countries, to embrace the digital society. Um, a little bit maybe about the fun facts. Then um, uh, XROAD offers currently over 3,000 various services to their, uh, um, to their members and, and users. And uh, uh, using or implementing or bringing new service to the XROAD is extremely, extremely simple. Uh, and and XROAD uh, core um, uh, team is helping uh, the, the service providers um, uh, achieve uh, the smooth transition. Uh, so um, there are 163 security servers. So these are uh, service providers uh, within Estonia offering various uh, you know, access to the information systems or registries, for example. Um, and I don't hear, have here the transactions, but it, it's millions per, per month that uh, um, uh, organizations and, and the end users are using and utilizing the framework because it's, it, it's a core part of, of our country's digital society nowadays. Uh, and uh, as seen from the previous slide, then uh, uh, the way how X Road is built, uh, how it's accessed, and, and the ac how the access is granted, uh, it makes it quite resilient uh, against traditional attack vectors, uh, today's attack vectors. Uh, so, about a little bit about my experience. Uh, so, it all started in 2016. Uh, initially, X Road. Um, didn't have any like strict security requirements. Uh, everything was running in software, but but by that time, um, uh, the regulatory body in Estonia decided that uh, the country will embrace the EIDAS uh, regulation. Uh, EIDAS has gone through the second iteration, uh, defining various security uh, needs, and and uh, in Estonia, RIA decided that. Uh, X Road needs to meet the EIDAS uh, requirement. So, uh, starting with X Road version 6, the uh, HSM was required. Uh, there was discussion either have uh, common criteria or FIPS. Um, this comes into play when we talk about electronic signatures and seals uh, because uh, FIPS certification allows you to have advanced. Um, um, uh, seals and certificates, uh, uh, signatures, meaning that if there's already um, agreed or some, uh, agreement between the parties, how the system uh, uh, or how the communication uh, is working and, and, and there's also a trust established already, then uh, the, the FIPS requirement is enough. But then again, if you're talking to uh, unknown entities uh, in EU, then 
the common criteria uh, assures that uh, you have the maximum security standards and, and the issuing party can be fully trusted. And also since um, uh, it was rather new, uh, there was various um, uh, performance, uh, unknown performance estimates and uh, various, let's say, growth, uh, growth challenges uh, with the, uh, with with the X-Road. And now since uh, X-Road is using e electronic seals uh, and also timestamping, it is subject to EIDAS. Uh, and this means that the hardware security device uh, is mandatory or strongly recommended. It a little bit depends how, what system and how the X-Road is being used, but um, uh, using HSM is uh, strongly, strongly recommended. So how the uh, X-Road server operates uh, and, and how the HSM is being used. Uh, so you have the security server, uh, which then talks to rest of the X-Road members uh, and service providers within the X-Road ecosystem. Um, and um, X-Road security server then is connected to HSM. HSM is holding the keys and certificates required um, for, for signing and stamping the uh, transactions um, that are happening within the XROOT framework. Uh, and it's used over the PKC 11 uh, protocol. So, and, and also um, implementing the, the uh, HSM with XROOT is extremely simple nowadays because it already, XROOT already has the built-in support uh, for, for XROOT, uh, sorry, for the HSMs. So it's really seamless, uh, just uh, doing a couple of configuration changes and then you already can create the keys, import the certificates and, and your new information system can be used or it can offer various services within the uh, XROOT uh, framework. Of course, this is really simplified uh, view of the, uh, of the use case, uh, but in, the reality is a little bit different. So um, you have many, many XROOT servers, uh, service providers, um, uh, and, and usually they for sure they have tests and, and production servers are in cluster. They might have also development in house or they are outsourcing it. Um, they are connected to um, HSM cluster. This so far has been uh, on-premise. Uh, but there are various options uh, how you can implement the, um, the HSMs uh, with XROOT server. Um, and, and now the, the customers, when using XROOT and HSMs, they, they notice that actually the HSMs can be used to secure all kinds of other systems. Uh, with their, within their own network, because as, as I said, that the HSM is used in various uh, 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 sectors and also with various services. Then, for example, uh, internal document registries ha are being imp uh, implemented or connected to HSMs to digitally sign and seal internal documents, for example, or any kind of other services that the organization is providing and not related to XROAD at all. Um, they might have other portals uh, they are using or providing um, to their customers or any kind of other IT systems to secure their internal uh, uh, PK, PKI uh, uh, and store root certificates there, um, implement with the firewalls and, and so on. So HSMs also are helping the, the companies to, to bring up their basic security standards uh, uh, internally. Now, um, traditionally, uh, the, the HSMs have been used uh, locally with, uh, when we talk about the, the X-Roads. Um, but nowadays there are emerging new opportunities. Uh, in Estonia, for example, we have local service providers we are, which are hosting X-Road servers 
uh, which are connected to HSMs on the on the service providers cloud. Uh, but you could, of course, also uh, have various deployment scenarios. For example, you could deploy the X Road servers in Azure, AVS, Google Cloud. Uh, also, you can have uh, the HSMs uh, in your own data center that you have access to it, or you you are uh, uh, buying the HSMs as a service, which is also uh, 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 being used more and more nowadays. Traditionally, the security side and HSM ha side has been really traditional, uh, that uh, everything has to be on-premise, but uh, there are definitely benefits, uh, financial benefits, operational benefits when using it as a service. Now, one can wonder that, uh, uh, that you know, HSM, uh, why we actually use it and, and what but benefits it gives you over the, uh, uh, over the traditional software. So, first of all, the software, uh, uh, there are various issues with software. So, uh, for example, when we talk about keys uh, or encryption keys or keys in, keys in general, even if they are encrypted, if you're using it in software, they are loaded into RAM. Um, and, and RAM memory, there are various attacks, how you can access um, uh, the keys or the which are encrypted in the memory and extract them. Also, when you store your keys in software, they can easily be deleted uh, by accident on our days in cyber security threat site, uh, um, uh, encrypted by, by malware. Uh, you also need to maintain the software, uh, make sure that it's always up to date, mitigate zero day exploit attacks, uh, patch it uh, pretty regularly. Um, there is a uh, you know various uh, risks coming from the compromised network side, a comp compromised uh, communication side. It's it's uh, it, it might be a challenge to audit what's going on with your key usage, uh, and also they they have these pseudo random number generators, um, which uh, meaning that the keys being generated or created. Uh, might be weaker than they are supposed to be. So HSM is trying to address all these shortcomings from uh, from the software side, meaning that the HSMs are tamper resistant. They also, so if somebody tries to access physically uh, the electronics uh, of, of HSM, they also tamper responding, meaning that if, if a physical attack is detected, they react to it. Um, they also meet uh, strictly various security control uh, measures and, and needs and regulations. Uh, they also meet the uh, regulatory um, and contractual uh, requirements. Of course, uh, offer secure key storage. Uh, they are uh, really well auditable and offer true random generation, which assures the, the highest level of entropy when creating uh, your private keys. So a couple of ways that actually uh, your key material certificates are protected. Uh, so if you store your information for a lo really long time in, in memory, then you could have a memory burning, meaning that equivalent would be with OLED screens, uh, the older ones that you might have uh, burning, that actually the, the entire key will be burned into a memory, which you can extract then. Um, and also there are various measures how you can protect yourself against statistical attacks, how long it takes to generate keys, how much power it takes, etc., which is pretty much, uh, uh, which you can't do with soft software. And also when a physical attack uh, is detected, the keys will be inaccessible within two milliseconds. Uh, it it uh, protects also by accidental power loss even for a longer longer periods when UPS is run out and, 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 and so on. So they have various voltage and temperature sensor, sensors also when you try to uh, 
uh, attack the um, HSMs using, using various uh, environment uh, factors. So you can ask that how, what do you mean physically protecting the key materials uh, 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 with HSM? So yes, indeed, there are physical layers that protect the electronics, uh, the, the circuit boards of HSM. This is PCI card here uh, that you have uh, FIPS level, uh, level 41, that you have uh, metal casing, then sensory foil, which actually is then the, the sensor that detects uh, various chemical, for example, uh, attacks or, or penetration attacks, uh, potting that you can be tamper evident, and then uh, next, uh, next layer, extra layer of, of metal casing um, uh, to, to uh, provide even more security. Now, HSMs come in, in various shapes and sizes. Uh, you can start from really small chips, TPM chips, and, and uh, everybody probably uh, uh, is, is wearing or using HSM on daily basis when it comes to even using smart cards, credit cards. Um, and the HSMs for, uh, go from uh, HSM-based uh, one to PCI, and of course, the highest performance ones are LAN appliances. And nowadays, of course, you can have uh, uh, cloud environments, which is more cost-effective, of course, um, in, in several ways. Now, uh, HSM also provides uh, secure communication out of the box. Uh, meaning which that you can use the HSMs uh, over public internet. So everything is secured and encrypted, uh, all the requests, even before they go to the HSM itself. Um, you can use uh, various standards uh, and ways how you can talk to HSM. The most widely used is PKCS11, open source, really well documented uh, API then if you would have any kind of Microsoft related environments or, or information systems, you could use uh, CNG API or when using uh, Java applications, then uh, a JCE API can be used, it could be used to talk to HSMs. There are others, others more, but these are, would be the, the major ones um, uh, be, being used in the market. Now, bringing everything together, which we just talked about, then uh, we have EIDAS from the regulatory and, and unification perspective, setting the standards, regulations um, within the EU itself. Then we have XROAD from the framework, framework side, allowing the communication to, to flow freely between um, the participating parties. And lastly, HSN from the security and compliance point of view, uh, so together, they allow to bring us trust, security, and efficiency into the digital society uh, and an economy. Um, so hopefully setting the landmark, uh, others to follow. So uh, we are seeing wider, wider adoption of, of X-Road and, and the benefit it's bring, uh, it, it brings to, uh, to, to countries, um, coupled with root of trust, uh, so hopefully more countries will ensure that they, their citizens can fully enjoy the, the fruits of the, uh, today's digital society. So thank you for listening. Um, and I'm uh, open for any questions you might have. Yeah, we <clears throat> don't have uh the questions at the moment. Uh, um, then maybe I can um, I can cover maybe some questions I've received uh, over the years regarding X Road. Um, so in in general, um, X Road has brought a lot of benefits to Estonian digital society in, in general. Um, uh, allowing uh, first of all the, the management overhead, the simplicity, how things operate, how citizens can access various uh, systems and services really easily. And, and, um, uh, and now the, uh, 
when talk about the technology side, uh, then uh, start using the X-Road itself uh, and, and setting up the, the, uh, the, the uh, technology is, is also pretty straightforward nowadays that they have, um, and even start testing the X-Road. Um, then it's really simple to set up all the systems, requirements, uh, and also HSM site uh, using simulators and, and, and so on. Uh, Daniel, we have one question at uh, chat, yes. on the chat uh, window. Uh, if you can <clears throat> reply or share some examples, it would be good. So there's a, um, have you already observed any attempts the, uh, to the security layer air breaches? Um, yes, X-Road framework has been attacked. Um, uh, well, we, we can't really say who. Um, it's quite difficult in, uh, in nowadays uh, world, digital world. But yes, uh, there has been um, uh, DDoS attacks, trying to bring it down when we have had uh, elections, for example, <laughs> especially in the beginning. There was a lot of doubt uh, that it's not secure. Um, but the truth is that it's open source. This can be audited. It's audited on co uh, the constantly. And the more members, uh, uh, more countries start using X-Road, then through that we can, we have more resources, let's say more eyes uh, that are looking into the X-Roads, uh, testing it, uh, trying its securities. And so far, the X-Road have stood the test of time and we haven't had any major breaches or incidents. Uh, and, and especially because of the, the, how it's been designed, that nobody just randomly can't uh, join the uh, X-Road. You need to go through the operator register your your services uh, and and also the um, service providers decide uh, or decide who can ac get access uh, to certain services so there are many many layers uh, implemented that ensure that uh, the, the maximum um, uh, security Of course, uh, just to add that, of course, the, the service providers need to, um, you know, make, maintain their internal security, of course. Because they are providing the registries and so on. But in general, uh, the, the X-Route as a framework, uh, it's really, really hard to attack. And uh, it's constantly being monitored any, uh, for any kind of bad actors 24-7. So uh, there are really strict measures. Uh, to mitigate any kind of uh, cyber threats. Mm -hmm. Okay, Daniel. <clears throat> and the second question is, uh, <clears throat> do the system have uh, <clears throat> some bottlenecks? Of course, uh, in IT systems, the main bottleneck is that uh, understanding uh, how, if you are a service provider, you are offering some kind of a registry hosting a registry that's being uh, accessed understanding that what will be the usage meaning that you need to provision your systems understanding how how it will be utilized um, you might think that it's going to be used in one way that it turns out that you know suddenly other systems start uh, asking information from you and bringing the uh, the usage and resource requirements higher so provisioning in that sense is a major challenge uh, usually and now x route 7 uh, which is due to come up come out in november is addressing all these kind of um, questions as well that you can uh, get more statistics and better statistics out of your x route environment because with these statistics you can design and understand first of all who's using how is using your systems and then this allows you to um, uh, design a better system or better systems. And of course, uh, um, Altacom together uh, with our partners, we are helping any uh, parties interested in joining uh, or, or trialing X-Road uh, with any kind of implementation, consultative services, um, 
Yeah. So in Estonia, Altacom has worked closely with government and various entities uh, to ensure, uh, first of all, the compliance side and also helping with uh, employment, uh, deployment, sorry. Okay, 